Greetings YouTube. Today I'm going to talk about the new Pathfinder book, Ultimate Magic. As you can well imagine, this book concentrates on spellcasters. Though it does touch upon the partial spellcasters such as paladins and uh, rangers. And the biggest um, part of this book as far as the impact of the general community is that it's got a new core class in it. And that is known as the Magus. And the Magus is a partial spellcaster, six level spells, um, that is a fully functional fusion of fighter and mage. Out of the box, designed specifically to be a proper fighter mage. Okay, this is the kind of classic meme that has never been done all that well in the past, I don't think, in D&D. And now we have the Pathfinder version of it, and it seems to be look. It seems to look pretty good. So I'm gonna give you a rundown. I'm alignment any uh, die eight hit dice, two skill skill ranks, which is a crying shame. I still am a proponent of the concept that no class should ever have less than four skill ranks. Um, it is a three quarter bab, up to six level spells. Um, at twentieth uh, level, you've got five across the board. Uh, from zero up through six, the uh, as I said, they have uh, access to martial weapons and light uh, armor, though that improves over time. And this is very much a dual, uh, uh, a two weapon fighter, martial weapon in one hand, spell in the other. Now you also have access to an arcane pool, which is points which you can use to fuel your abilities and make your bet your weapon better by getting pluses to it, other other features like that. So you could have a, a weapon that had a magical abilities on it, and then you could tack more onto it using your arcane pool. Or you could tack on abilities if you weren't high enough level yet, or didn't have the money to have an actual um, magic weapon. You also have things called um, Magus Arcana, and these are different abilities which you use your arcane pool points to fuel. For example, allowing you to do additional uh, attacks, uh, counter strikes, um, letting you do. There's one in here, building here, which is cool, which lets you power your offhand with elemental energy of one type or another um, and make a touch attack. So you're literally like this ball of energy in your hand, which you're zapping people with and you're touching. Very cool image. I could quite like that. I think it would be very interesting if you were to take this character and if it was sitting in a, in a campaign that had uh, revolvers. That would be very John Woo. I think that would be cool. Now, this is not a clan that is something, a class that really has a whole lot of interest for me. I've never wanted to play a fighter mage. However, I've read through it and it seems to be functional and viable. I have not play tested it, but it does seem like it will work. It has a lot of flexibility. Um, a lot of other options available, so I think that it's uh, it's definitely worth your time. Um, then we're going to have the sections that deal with existing spellcasting classes. For example, uh, the uh, the alchemist. There are going to be some new abilities in here, some new formulas, and some new archetypes. For example, the chirurgian. That's all about the healing uh, magic. The internal alchemist, which is about fueling your own personal powers over any others. Um, the preservationist, which is about preserving the things that you find, literally, like keeping the the, the things that you've uh, found in the dungeons and things around as useful tools. Um, the reanimator, which is you know the reanimator movie is perfect in here, uh, which is all about reanimating things and using them as your uh, uh, slaves. And the vivisectionist, which is kind of creepy. Um, then we have the bard, and the one thing that stuck out for me is they have masterpieces. Now masterpieces are quite powerful. They essentially take up either a feat or an entire slot of spells. For example, they have one here called the Dance of 23 Steps and it takes either a feat or all of your second level spells. But it's a major musical power that you could then refer to later and use more than once a day. Um, and uh, I gotta tell you, I've never been a big fan of the Bard. The Bard has never been a class that's interesting to me. The last bard I had interested in was the old first edition bard, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, but none of our, I don't think any of us ever actually ever made bard because the requirements were so incredibly hard to, to, re, to meet. Um, then you have um, the archetypes uh, for animal speaker, um, the dirge bard, which is all about being all emo. Uh, the sound striker, which is about doing 
sonic damage. Quite a few things in this book do sonic damage. I think that they were trying to fill in a few of the gaps that, that there isn't a lot of sonic damage abilities in the, in the game, so they kind of filled that in. Um, then we have the uh, Cleric, which covers variant channel, uh, channeling abilities. For example, air, sky, wind, um, art, music, you know, basically using your channeling ability to fuel other capability, as opposed to just turning and dead and things like that. Uh, we have monster turning in there. Then we have different archetypes, the Cloistered Cleric, reviving that for the Pathfinder game. Um, the Undead Lord, for all the, all the wannabe uh, liches out there. Then we have the Druid, and the Druid is nice because they have terrain and animal domains, so the people who want to play domain druids now have a much better selection. And, uh, of course, they could also be used by other clerics if you wanted to add these domains to your campaign. Now, one thing in here I really liked was a nice combo. If you took a, a frog domain, and a frog domain lets you have, or at 6th level, you get a swim speed, and at 12th level, you get a climb speed. So you're covering all terrains. And the swamp domain lets you see through uh, mist and plants and water. Okay? So you can breathe underwater, you can swim, you can climb, and you have almost perfect concealment in a swamp. This is going to be a killer combo, literally, for NPC uh, druids when facing off against a group. You tack that onto a lizard man, and, you know, or, or, or an orc, or a kobold. And they're going to be picking off characters right and left because they're never going to know what hit him in a swamp. I really like that idea. Uh, then we have talking about Vermin Companion, which I always thought was a, a gap in the game. For some reason, people always treat Vermin as really special and weird and freaky. And I don't think they should be because there's a lot of balance issues with them. If you're walking around with a wolf, no one's really going to bat an eye. It's a big dog. But if you're walking around with an ant, okay, that's weird. But it's a giant ant. They're not that scary. But if you're walking around a giant centipede, no one's going to let you in their town. You know. So there's a certain balance there. Um, I've never understood quite why you wanted to put restrictions on vermin uh, companions, but this does away with them and gives them an, as an option to the players. Uh, then we have a number of different shaman ideas, like a dragon shaman druid pulling your powers from a particular theme, and there's a number of them in here, Dragon being the first one that lays down all the guidelines for that, and a number of other ones that, uh, for example, the Saurian Shaman, which pulls things from uh, dinosaurs, they don't redo every single description, they make a number of references to the Dragon sh Shaman, which is nice, it saves space in the book. Uh, storm Druid, which is uh, your, for your, all your storm-based themes. Then we get into the Inquisitor. Now, I just skim this chapter. I don't like Inquisitors. The whole concept of a divine enforcer just rankles me on a lot of levels. I want nothing to do with Inquisitors. I would never have Inquisitors be anything but bad guys if I was a GM. The concept of divine uh, enforcer is to me something that is an anthem to a good alignment. I just, sorry, don't get it. Uh, you want to go hunt undead, use a paladin, you know what I mean? You don't need somebody enforcing your your deities will in the world against uh, good aligned people I think that's kind of just twisted um, and of course again they've got uh, archetypes in here as well in case you want to play different types of uh, inquisitors then we go into monk section now monks aren't actual spellcasters but this gives you a whole bunch of vows of divine nature kind of like out of the exalted deeds for example a vow of chains you wear chains to show your humility vow of cleanliness, vow of fasting, vow of peace, you get the point. And each one gives you more chi points or chi points for your pool, and then they give you a bunch of abilities that you can use those points to fuel. So your character becomes very much, you know, power issue powering actual magical abilities of casting spells, enhanced movement, uh, you know, things like that. You really become a wushu you know, Dragon Ball Z monk, which is, if that's what you've been looking for, but you're the archetype you've been trying to achieve, this book's got you covered. Um, then we get into the Oracle, and they have a bunch of different new mystery uh, themes, and I really like the Ancestor theme, because the illustration, I think it's a halfling or a gnome, I can't quite tell, but it's using the Avudon Priest 
look. So they get the skull uh, painted on his face, got the kind of a top hat. Very well done. I think it was very evocative. Um, it, it made me smile when I, when I saw it. Uh, and I think they had a time theme for your, uh, which is, you ever want to play a time, Time Lord? Well, here you go. <laughs> uh, a wood and uh, metal, if you want to round out the Asian, uh, ele the elemental selection. Now, for some strange reason, they have the elemental selection here of the Asian Chinese style as wood, metal, earth, fire, water. Now, I've always seen it fire, water, air, wood, metal. Wood, metal being earth split in two. It, that's just me. I thought, that, I thought that having earth in there was kind of redundant if you also had metal and wood, but what can I say? Uh, then we have uh, a paladin and different oaths. Oaths against corruption, uh, oath against undeath, and each of these oaths gives you slightly different paladin abilities. So if you're looking for a slightly different take on how your, how your uh, paladin uh, uh, rolls, here you go. Then you get into rangers, and the rangers introduce semi-magical traps and an archetype that emphasizes laying these semi-magical traps. And there's a number of feats in the book that also uh, bo give bonuses to these trap-making features. I, was, I hadn't thought of it, so it's kind of a nice idea. If it, it might be something you're interested in. Then we get into sorcerers. Lots of sorcerer stuff in here. New bloodlines, the accursed, uh, the jinn, and there's a there's a a, a, a a genie one for each of the four elements. And so they've got uh, themes for those things if you want to use them. And if you have like a, a you know an Ara uh, Arabian uh, night kind of theme in your campaign, uh, the Rakshasa uh, bloodline. The Shaitan, which is the Earth Elemental version of the uh, Genie. Uh, then we have Cross-Blooded Archetype, which allows you to combine two. Wild-Blooded, which is, you know, you don't have as much control over your, your bloodlines. So that kind of makes things a little weird. Uh, a little kind of a, a chaos magic kind of a concept there. Um, then we get into the Summoner. Uh, new base form, which is the Aquatic form. Uh, new... Um, uh, Edelon models. I think I'm saying Edelon correctly. I'm not sure. Um, Angel, Beher, Bodyguard, Centaur, and how little formulas of how to achieve them, which is a nice uh, idea if you haven't come up with ideas that you're happy with or you want to build off of these ideas. Um, uh, undeath, and there's a how to make undead Edelons. That's kind of an interesting idea. Uh, then we have new evolutions, which that isn't really a real surprise. Then they have an archetype, a broodmaster, which is having more than one. So you're very much doing the whole um, beastmaster kind of a route. Then you have the master summoner, which is you know enhances uh, your summoning capability. Um, then we get into the witch, which is you know new hexes, major hexes, grand hexes. Um, then we have the uh, New archetypes, Beast Bonded, Grave Walker, Hedge Witch. I kind of like the Hedge Witch. I've always liked the idea of a Hedge Witch. Then you get into Wizards, and they introduce Arcane Discoveries, which are essentially taking a slot of a feat. And what they do, I'll give you an example of one, which is the making Golems. Now, if you want to make a Golem, you have to take Wondrous Magic Item, uh, Magic Armor and Weapons, and Construct, construct uh, Crap con Construct. That's three feats. Now, say if you only ever want to make flesh golems. You've always wanted to play Frankenstein. You can take the Construct Golem Arcane Mystery. will will let you make one type of golem with one feat. So you're getting all of the other features from those other three feats, but you can only make flesh golems. And if your character is only ever going to make one kind of golem, this saves you spending two feats. And that is awesome because feats are precious like blood. You don't want to be spending them unless you really have to. Um, new schools, the metal school, the wood school, again, because they're doing the whole um, uh, Asian, Chinese uh, uh, elemental theme. Then they're talking about how to come up with new spells, how to balance them and things like that. They introduce magical diseases. They're known as uh, spell blight. Some of them are minor, some of them are major. For example, you get cataracts, and as you cast more magic, the cataracts get worse and worse and worse until you go blind, and there are different ways of how to get rid of these, these blights. Some are very difficult to get rid of, so they can be very thematically interesting in a long-term campaign. Um, I like the idea of 
uh, magical uh, diseases. I have used magical parasites in the past, so I fully and uh, endorse that particular concept. Um, then they talk about summoning creatures. Now, I've never been a big believer in summoning. I always thought that was kind of an evil thing to do, summoning and something binding something. But if you have a player of the character, a player character who wants to do that, or you have an NPC and you want real details on how to do that, this has got you covered. Uh, and they also talk about uh, constructing uh, constructing constructs and some different ideas about different power levels and some new uh, feats and things that will allow you to have more versatility in your constructs. Um, then they introduce bunches of new magic items. Of course, that's really cool. And they talk about um, mechanics, saving throws, uh, different schools, bonus types of effects, uh, multi-purpose spells, um, things like that. Then we get into a whole section on feats. That's not going to surprise you. This is a you know a very crunchy book, which I happen to love. Then they get into words of power, and this introduces a concept of word spells, where you have a few words of power, like one. Some words are shapes, like self, another person, a barrier. Some words are effects, uh, words of healing, words of wounding, words of fire, words of teleportation. And you have meta words, which are like a boost or different ways of modifying the other two words. And you combine these in different ways so you can make spells on the spot when you need them. And I can understand why they did this, because some people don't like the Vancey and Magic system. Some people don't like the point spell point system. That is uh, essentially what it, what the Psionic system is, and with Pathfinder, we now have access to the Psionics Unleashed book, which is awesome. Go buy that book. Um, and so they introduced this. I'm going to do a separate video on my discussions on this. I'm not going to fill it up. It looks viable, and if this is something that you've been interested in, uh, there you go. And the rest of the book is pretty much nothing but spells and lots of them. And some of them were quite good because I think a couple of them made me think of someone really put their put themselves and projected themselves into the game because they created spells that a person in a magical world would invent. For example, there's two spells, kind of the counter to each other. One strips a corpse of all flesh and leaves you a nice, clean skeleton. Another one adds flesh to a skeleton that you found. So you can re then look at the creature, what it looks like, for identification purposes or turning it into a zombie. Um, and these, to me, are spells that would be created because they would be needed in a world of magic. And I like the way that that, that kind of thinking. That means, to me, that's a very thorough way of game design. They also, again, you know, there's a bunch of Sonics in here. I mean, rather, a bunch of Sonic spells in here and a bunch of uh, electrical and cold spells, which I think fill in some of the gaps that their the damaging spells may have had in the past. They're kind of trying to fix that. Um, so overall, I was very impressed with the Ultimate Magic. I think if you're playing a magical type of character or you're a GM, this is a book you're really going to want to look at. Um, and if you like Fighter Mages, the Magus is probably going to be something that's going to be right up your alley. Overall, I can't really say anything negative about this. I definitely think it's worth your time.